and welcome to this edition of Hidden History Stories from the Secret City. I'm Keith McDaniel, along with my co-host, Ray Smith. Hello, Ray. How are you? Hey, I'm very good today, Keith. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. Uh, we, uh, we have a special guest with us today that, uh, that uh, you made an acquaintance with and, uh, and, and, and uh, am developing a friendship with. Why don't you introduce our guest today, Ray? Very good. Thank you. We're so happy to have Rachel Colby with us today. Uh, you're right. We met just a few months ago when she came to Oak Ridge for a tour, and I gave her a tour of the Oak Ridge History Museum. Uh, as a part of that conversation, we learned we had a very uh, a mutual interest in a story, uh, and the story, I think, started out about uh, the Davis Brothers cafeteria and how it was desegregated in the 60s and, and how uh, Guilford Glazier had a part in that. And, and she had the same story from the same source, that source being uh, uh, James Spicer, who had written a story about Oak Ridge. But uh, the connection is that James Spicer's co-minister at the Chapel on the Hill at that time was Roy Colby. Roy Colby happens to be Rachel's father-in-law. So you can imagine how I felt when I learned she had that personal connection with someone who had been a part of this. To me, it was a notebook of really interesting things. I didn't know the people, but now I had a connection through her to the people. And I've enjoyed working with her over the last few weeks as she's prepared material to go in historically speaking. And we've gotten to work together to help her get some connections in Oak Ridge to continue the work that she's doing in, in writing a book about that period of time in Oak Ridge. So Rachel, just, just start us off by telling us what you're doing and, and talk about your father-in-law a bit and, and let us know how you got interested in the Oak Ridge situation in the 60s. Well, um, like I had written in the first article, um, <laughs> I knew my in-laws had been involved in civil rights as civil rights activists, um, but they didn't talk a lot about it. Um, I knew the story um, about the March Against Fear first that they participated in, and it was actually when my father-in-law died that Dr. James Spicer um, spoke at his funeral and he mentioned a story about a church camp hosted, I believe in 1963, judging by the church photographs in their little magazine. Um, that was integrated and it caught my attention and stayed with me um, for, oh, like 17 years maybe <laughs> before I called him. <laughs> said, can you tell me that story again? And he um, told me more. And um, so we were trying to decide how he was gonna get these to me. And, you know, if he was gonna record them, what we were gonna do. And he ended up writing them down and sending them to me and saying, well, do what, you know, do what you would like with this. <laughs> it started out with me thinking that I would write a children's picture book based on the camp story. And then I went to my first writer's conference in 2019 and told her about my idea and said, I had all these other stories too. And she was like, um, can you do an adult book based on all the stories? <laughs> And when I asked Dr. Spicer, do you want to do you want to work on this together? He was like, I already gave you my story, gave you the story. I said what I said. So, you know, do what you, you know, do what you'd like with it and take it from there. So um, he's a joy. I'm in touch with him and his daughter, Lynn. And um, he is he's obviously proud of what you're doing because his article that we published following your first article was very complimentary. So I think you've got a good relationship with him for sure. Oh, he's a blessing. And so is his, so is his, his whole family is really. Um, I had the opportunity to also interview his son-in-law, um, John Terrell. And when I visited in 2019, and I visited um, this um, last year too, when I went to the conference and he was a lifeguard at the Oak Ridge pool in high school and in early part of college. And so he had some stories to tell about that. And I'm hoping to hear some more stories of the Oak Ridge pool and its integration. So um, one of them is actually a gentleman I'm hoping to find too. Um, and from the pool incident, he mentioned a gentleman by the name of Calvin Angel, who was a black lifeguard at the Oak Ridge pool. And I would love to speak to him and hear his perspective. Mm -hmm. 
I, that would be good. I, the name doesn't ring a bell with me. I hope you can locate him. I, I know you've got several good connections in Oak Ridge and, and have interviewed several people as a part of your research, but I'm sure you'll find him as well. What, tell, tell us a little bit about, uh, about your book and what, what, I mean, how, 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 what is your book going to be like? What's it going to be about? I know, I know it's in general uh, integration in Oak Ridge, I guess. So yes. tell us a little bit about it. Well, I'm figuring it out as I go a lot. Um, letting the, I think you have to kind of let the stories lead you, if mm -hmm. that makes sense. And um, my hope is to show the perspective of both black and white perspective. Like I realized that what I had from Dr. Spicer was wonderful and the stories from my mother-in-law and sister-in-law's memories of integration in Oak Ridge were, they're wonderful, they're priceless, but I needed a black perspective also. And so I'm hoping to get perspectives of, you know, those that were young, those that were older in all different, whatever setting they were in whatever part they played at the time. And I'm, I'm seeing, and I, I figured I would see very different perspectives, but also see where they overlapped to. So both their similarities and their differences in perspectives. And the goal is, you know, our nation's divided right now. We've got a lot of division is to, to just bring about the, show the history of integration in Oak Ridge and, um, the lessons and that can be applied to today and just show reconciliation so black and white people working together would be part of my goal. Uh, you know, one, th one thing you may want to do uh, if you've not done this already is, and Ray and I could probably help you with this, is uh, the Center for Oak Ridge Oral History. Uh, we've done a number of uh, interviews and I know I personally, I did what, about 400 of those interviews that are in the oral history collection. And I probably did at least a half a dozen or maybe even more with people that were involved in the integration struggle and in the integration fight in the early 1960s. You mentioned, you know, Willie Golden. I know I interviewed Willie and he had some great stories. And, and um, what was the lady's name? She and her husband, they were scientists, Ray, live on the East End. Um, she, was, uh, she was really involved in the integration um, anyway, not the, uh, East, West, the West End, they lived on the West End, uh, and they were also involved in the, uh, in the, um, the, uh, Greenway, you know, the Greenways and, and, um, yeah. anyway, well, I'll think of their name, but anyway, she, she had great stories about, about and, and their, their involvement there, you know, from a white perspective, uh, their involvement in the integration. So, uh, so there may be, there may be a resource for you as well, so. Ray, are you there? Uh, it looks like everything's kind of frozen up. Well, <laughs> there we go. We could literally so, give you links yeah. to them. Yes. And Keith will think of that lady's name and we'll for sure give you that one. But I I, uh, I will tell you, and I've, I've not tried to lead you, as you know, in your research in any direction other than to give you contact with people. But I will tell you that before Roger Cloutier died, he's the first person that focused me on the issues of the schools and the integration in the 60s. And his focus was from a white perspective but it was from the perspective of the number of white people in Oak Ridge that helped and assisted in getting uh, the integration done. Now, obviously Spicer and Colby were among the leaders and the fact that there was a, a council at, uh, on, on the relations council, there was a, a, a good bit of effort in Oak Ridge that you didn't find in other cities around in the Southeast. So I'm, I'm sure that that will come out in, in your book as well, but there's a rich story there for sure. Right. And I'm glad that that research. Tell us about some of the people that you've interviewed. Okay, well, um, actually, um, well, I have a list of them here, but one of them, um, you mentioned the schools and it's not just what was, you asked, you'd mentioned, you know, what I've learned. It amazes me how long this process took and it's still evolving in a way 
um, as you know, recently they, they started picketing the restaurants in 1960, but it wasn't until, you know, Davis Brothers is one of, one of the holdouts till 63. Um, the high school was integrated um, in 1955, but the elementary school and the second middle, the second uh, middle school, junior high school wasn't integrated in 1967, which blew my mind. I'm like, that is a long time. And so I had the absolute pleasure of speaking to Mr. Brian Roebuck, who um, was in the elementary school. He came a year after it was integrated, but nevertheless, it was still a process. And he was friends with people who helped integrate um, uh, you know, the elementary and the second middle school. And so I will be speaking to three of those, three of those gentlemen in the next week or so, I guess, and um, heard quite a bit from Mr. Brian Roebuck He's also connected me to some Facebook groups and things like that. So um, I'm, it's, it's interesting to see how long it's taken. I've spoken to Mr. Archie Lee and <laughs> uh, he reminds me of Fran Silver. They're both very spirited. <laughs> yes, you're right. Yeah. And of yeah. course you, uh, you talk with Larry Gibson, LC Gibson. I've spoken to Mr. Gibson and he's been a wonderful help. Um, he's a very kind gentleman, very easy to, speak to, um, I recently spoke to Greg and Martha Nisley, and hopefully I'll be speaking to some of their friends and siblings also. Um, and they were part of, um, they were in the high school and the, well, from the elementary school integration too. Um, so let's see, um, I've spoken very briefly to Yvonne Mims <laughs> and she was, um, she was uh, worked at the daycare with under Mr. Mrs. Margaret Phillips. Scarborough daycare and um, let's see, Liz Bartlett and Janet Bartlett. Um, they were from Chapel on a Hill. Judy Cohan, who's been incredibly helpful. <laughs> She's amazing <laughs> finding people and sharing her stories. She shared a very powerful story about Hugh Barnett, who was a church custodian at Chapel on the Hill. My father-in-law hired him. And for a little bit of story, when he hired him, he was questioned, why did you choose him? And he said, because he's qualified. And they said, excuse me, but where is he going to go to the bathroom? And they weren't that nice. <laughs> my father-in-law was like, he can use my bathroom. <laughs> but he became very beloved by the children. He was a wonderful man. And I would love to speak to his children, to Mr. Um, because I, I'd really like to know a little bit more about this man because he's so beautifully spoken of. Um, yeah, that, those are some good connections. Let, let me give you some insight into the the delay of the time of the of the uh, elementary schools. Have you run into anyone, or in any of your research, have you run across the name Arizona officer? Yes, I have. <laughs> then you will recognize that one of the reasons that that elementary school in Scarborough stayed as long as it did is because of the excellence of this officer and the programs that she brought to that school. Not only that, but also uh, some of the scientists from the laboratory assisted in the, uh, even in the high school before the integration in 1955. So, uh, and again, the balance is important and not, not to say that that integration shouldn't have happened sooner and shouldn't be more complete. But in fact, there are, there are instances of uh, people doing outstanding efforts to, to help in, in, the, in the situation. So uh, those well, are good of, interviews. Yes. One of the things I, that really stood out to me um, was how many of my interviewees from Scarborough um, this was only in relation to the school, not into other facilities, but said that they didn't want to integrate. And it was because their school, they had a great education and they had, a, they had an incredibly tight knit community in Scarborough and a support system that was amazing. And it was very, it was a sacrifice to them. I mean, really they're, they're I guess it'd be easy to think like, oh, you know, we're doing them. We're doing these people a favor by letting them, you know, integrate and have access to, you know, the the, the newer building and other facilities they didn't have. But they, in fact, were the gift to 
the gift to us, if you will, to enrich us by integrating. And those kids that integrated, it was a sacrifice for them. You know, it was, it was, they were a type of soldier, if you will, making a way for others and really enriching the rest of us. And I'm very grateful to them. And it's very moving to hear some of their accounts of how integrated effect, integration affected them. And interestingly, from both my black and white interviewees have had a request that they want to hear what the other side has to say, how integrated integration affected them in the classroom as children, you know, in that situation. So, you know, so, you know, um, you know Rachel, you're absolutely, you're absolutely right that there is, there's two stories. I mean, you know, there's, there's the, there's the, uh, the side from, from those being integrated uh, and then there's, you know, the other side from the from the other people in the town. And uh, I found that to be absolutely true in um, in my film that I did the Clinton 12 uh, about the integration of Clinton High School uh, was uh, there were two perspectives. Uh, and to be quite honest, there's still two perspectives on, on the events that happened. This was 60 years ago, you know, so or, or, or if not more, 60, 65 years ago. So. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how you navigate uh, and maneuver uh, ar around that. Uh, before I forget, uh, uh, Elizabeth and Bob Peel, those, that's yes. who I was thinking of earlier. I think that I think they have they passed uh, Ray. Do you know? Um, but uh -huh. Elizabeth, uh, I did. A, I did a great interview with Elizabeth and uh, she's uh, it's in the, the archives for the for Cora for the oral history collection. Uh, but she tells a great story about the uh, about the uh, first barber shop uh, in Oak Ridge and Jackson Square to be integrated and how that came to be. So uh, I would be interested in that since I have Dr. Spicer's perspective on that, and I've heard some from Fran Silver on that. So I'd mm -hmm. I'd love to see that from all angles. Absolutely, I will. I'll send you a link to Elizabeth Fields document it's online that she wrote about the integration story and in i do have it's have it have it and highlighted it <laughs> so, That's a yes it is um before i forget if you don't mind you asked who i'd spoken to i just also wanted to mention mr um john job an incredible <laughs> writer john is the one Gave me the book. Okay, he gave me the story that yes. Dr. Spicer wrote. Yeah, I know, and um, he told me that, and and David and Martha Hobson, who are the longest standing members, I believe, at Chapel on the Hill right now. So. They are. He knows the history of that church. Yes. <laughs> so. Um, well, you really made some very good connections there, and and I'm anxious to see uh, your final product. I'm even more anxious to see. Uh, your next historically speaking column that you're going to write for me. <laughs> yes, well. <laughs> do, Rachel, do you have a timeline? Do you have a, I mean, have you kind of set anything out or are you just going to kind of let things go as they develop? Uh, I'm going as fast as I'm able, which is way too slow. Um, but <laughs> so I don't, if you, if you mean, do I have a deadline? No, I don't have a deadline. I have, I have deadlines to speak to the publisher to actually by Tuesday I told her I would tell her what I've been up to in the last several weeks sure. so, so I do have those incremental um, to keep me going I'm very grateful for that it helps me pull everything together and sort of step back and see what I've done and where I you know where do I go next which phone call sure. which email do I send out next sure. but um, just just for the record um because I know <laughs> people may wonder too so just um the publisher that I, I've spoken to that's interested, um, she happens to be black and she happens to be um, the managing editor of the um, ethnic division of the publishing house she works for. So um, whatever that's worth to anyone who may be curious as to who's, who's requesting this. <laughs> so, but I'm very thrilled and honored to talk to all the people and hearing the stories, you know, from my family's perspectives and others. Um, I did want to mention something about my father-in-law okay. that kind of blew me away. Um, I was pondering the other day, um, listening to the different people's stories and how they responded to things and everything. 
And I wrote down <laughs> these words. I wrote, I wonder what makes one become embittered by life's hard knocks while another uses their fiery trials to fuel compassionate action to help others less fortunate and to better themselves. And I, I wrote that after talking to some of my interviewees and hearing my father-in-law actually had a pretty rough start in life. Um, it was a kind of a rocky home. His, his dad was kind of a challenge, let's say. And he and his brother would go pick up coal off the street. The, the coal truck dropped when they went by, um, growing up in Quincy, Mass, to heat the house. He made himself a makeshift desk out of a board and set it in the basement by the heater. And that's where he studied to put himself through Harvard um, and then went on to, then went on to Hartford um, Theological Seminary where he met Ambassador Andrew Young and they became friends and they were seminary classmates. And you know, then went on to the University of um, Chicago where he met Dr. Spicer and his wife and they became friends there. Um, so I was, I was pondering just my father-in-law, like how he, used what he went through and used it for, for good to, to build compassion and awareness in his life, as have some of my interviewees. Um, very interesting conversation with Mr. Brian Roebuck, very rich on things like forgiveness and just your way you think. And so then my mother-in-law gave me a new folder and I found this handwritten by my father-in-law and it seems in response to my pondering. He wrote, amazing, people's experiences early in life are sometimes quite negative, difficult, even painful. Sometimes basic needs are not met. And yet many persons rise above these circumstances. The will to grow and develop comes through and wins out. The flower blooms in the desert. The blade of green grass reaches for the sun through a crack in the rock. People grow and become more of what that person is meant to be. And I found that kind of amazing <laughs> after speaking to some of the people my father-in-law and um and I just have a high respect for people who have been through so much and have used it to help others and to propel themselves out of those situations and for betterment of us all is anyway. uh, right Joe is there is there anything that that we uh, as a community could help you with or is there anything that you need I know, I know you're doing, I know you're reaching out to folks, but, uh, you know, the people that watch this, uh, some of them may have some, uh, some, something that they could offer as far as contacts and things such as that. Yes, absolutely. Um, I would love to, I know a lot of them have gone on, but, um, I believe there's a couple people left who taught, whether it was, um, I don't know if there's anyone left from the high school, but maybe their family that taught in the high school. Um, and also the elementary school when it was integrated. I would love to speak to some of the teachers, both black and white, but especially black, because I'm imagining that is, that must be quite the, the challenge to be the minority in such a situation because they were sent to, you know, a couple teachers here, a couple teachers there, and a lot weren't sent anywhere from Scarborough when the schools were integrated. I would love to hear how they navigated that situation. Um, you know, with parents of students who weren't happy that they were there <laughs> mm -hmm. and how they just how they navigated that, like teach us. I'd, I'd love to hear their stories. And I would love to hear if anyone knows who the young man from Brown University who lived in Scarborough um, in the summer in the 60s and was sent under the umbrella of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee to help with integration. <laughs> If anybody can point me in the direction, um, I'm looking for anyone with stories on the Snow White restaurant. Um, let's see, I would love to hear from some, some black people that picketed. Um, I would love to hear from, let's see, I'm scrolling through my, my list here of, um, Anyone who went to the integrated church camp, which I believe was in 1963, um, both black and white. Um, I've heard a couple from some children that were white, that are white, <laughs> that went, attended the camp. I would love to hear from some black children that attended and even, you know, parents and grandparents that might remember that. Um, that was hosted by Chapel on the Hill. I would 
Hmm. Um, anyone who, let's see, the movie theaters, the lunch counters, just anyone who has stories, right? And also, you know, it's just, it's been amazing hearing stories of Scarborough growing up in Scarborough. Um, Mr. Archie Lee actually shared with me, um, Mr. Leroy White's paper he wrote about all the nicknames in Scarborough and gave me a little more insight into the community. I, and that's just priceless. Um, so he's one of the people I'm hoping to speak to next week. Um, so, I mean, the Oak Ridge Pool, I'm looking for stories in the Oak Ridge Pool. Um, any, and I'm open to others, the skating rink. I mean, we've got some of those, but actually um, there's people who have, um, I know from seeing something else on Facebook that have memories of the skating rink and integrate and they're trying to integrate the skating rink, which closed down. So I would love to hear from them too. Anyone who remembers when Ambassador Andrew Young, um, civil rights icon and Ambassador Andrew Young, when he preached at Chapel on the Hill, anyone with recollections, thoughts on that would be amazing. And I cannot believe we can't find a newspaper article on that. It was in the newspaper that he was coming. It was March 31st, 1963 that he preached mm -hmm. Sunday and Monday, but there we cannot find a follow-up newspaper article on what was said and how it was received. So I would mm -hmm. love to hear from anyone about that. And you're, any you're other working, stories? Pardon? You're working with Mike Stello yes. in the library on that. So if he can't find it, it ain't there. <laughs> right, well, he, he is not, and he's been absolutely marvelous. He's he's so passionate about what he does and so thorough. Yeah. So I guess we're looking for people who <laughs> yeah. um, who remember. Great. It's not in the newspaper. There's people out there. Um, really low on hearing back on the church camp, and and like I would, I there was a there was something on Facebook about dogs being released on people who went to the skating rink. Um, so I'm guessing there's quite a few stories on that skating rink and some others and and just the stories of hope, you know, and how people overcame what they did. And I have, like I said I have no I have no input from anyone yet who picketed who was black. So I would love to hear their side of it. And as as I talk to my interviewees, they they mention other events and stories too so i'm sure maybe people here will go well i'd like to share about this i i'd love to hear it i'd be honored um i i just consider it an honor and i think our nation needs to remember history learn from it and and hopefully build some bridges <laughs> all right well i i think it's a, a good effort that you're making and obviously i'm enjoying the opportunity that you've taken advantage of for historically speaking but looking forward to the book now when you talk to your publisher on tuesday don't be afraid to set yourself a deadline and when you're going to publish it because i know how hard it is to be thinking oh i got a lot more to do but plug your date out there and say that's when we're going to get it and you'll be amazed at how it'll fall together okay well i need some more people <laughs> need to have the balanced view from everyone so we have some gaps so i'm i'm hoping your wonderful citizens of scarborough and oak ridge will help out with that <laughs> well, i am too I'm, I'm, yeah yeah well we're we're really glad that you spent some time with us today and i'm i'm enjoying our relationship immensely so Let's continue plugging away at historically speaking and, and using that as you build in your book. Okay. Yes, sir. Oh, by, by the way, before we before we leave, go ahead and mention something about your website, tattoo it on your and your and your blogs that you're doing there. Just say something about that so people will have that if they're interested. Okay, so tattoo it on your tattoo it on your heart.com is my website. Um a place for seekers, followers, and writers. My goal to glorify God, encourage believers, reach the lost seekers, um, uh, connecting cultures' questions with Christianity's answers. I love to encourage writers, motivate creatives. Um, there is a category drop down to help people navigate that if they're looking for a particular, whether it's encouragement in faith or in their, their calling or whatever. And um, also, I have several interviews with pastors and pastors' wives. I have an amazing interview with this incredible hero called Mr. Ray Smith <laughs> on there too. 
Yes, I am on there, and I thank you for that. I appreciated doing that with you. I just started a series of interviews with police officers, and um, some of your citizens there have mentioned people, so I'm hoping they'll send them my way. I've just started a series of police officers. The goal is at least one from every state, and the first one is up. Wow. So. <laughs> That's a worthy goal. Good. Absolutely. All right, All right Ray. Um, Tell us, who, who do we have coming up scheduled next? Do we have anybody scheduled? Well, we, we do. I've been talking with a couple of people. You know that we were trying to work with Dr. Judith Stauber out of Los Alamos, and her, her family situation has caused us to have to delay that. I'm just now speaking with Pat Postma, and I'm hoping that Pat will join us, and you know her connection to the International Friendship Bell, and, yep. and obviously her relationship with in Oak Ridge. By the way, uh, Rachel Pat Postma was one of the students. Uh, actually, her father was the principal of the high school when it was integrated. Um, you need to interview her, put her on your list, and I'll help you make connection with her. Uh, she, has, uh, she has a unique perspective. Uh, they actually had a cross burned in their yard. So she, uh, she remembers, she and, and Larry Gibson did an interview for local television about the two perspectives as they saw it for the, for the uh, integration of the school. So Pat Postma, P-O-S-T-M-A, would be a good connection for you and we'll follow up there. And I'm hoping, uh, Keith, that we can get her on here. She has uh, just this past week been selected as the next uh, recipient of the ADFAC, Aid for Distressed Families of Appalachian Counties, Bowtie Award mm -hmm. in honor of uh, uh, Bill Wilcox. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm proud to say that Bill created that award and uh, he insisted that I be the first one to receive it. Now, this will be the 10th year that mm -hmm. someone in the community has been recognized and Pat is the one that's recognized oh, for good. 2022. Be good to get her on here. I can talk her into it. Okay. All right. Well, that sounds great. Thank you so much yes, for well, thank you so much for joining us today. We really, really appreciate it, and we hope uh, people that are listening will respond uh, well. We will uh, we'll try to put uh, some contact information uh, in the comments uh, with this video, and uh, that way people can reach out to you if they need to. Thank you, Mr. McDaniel. Thank you, Mr. Smith, for having me. All right. Glad to have you. Thank you. Thank right. you. And folks, thanks for watching, and we will see you again in a couple of weeks.